So, welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. Wherever you are, literally wherever you are, whatever state you are in, you are welcome here. Um, Zoom participants, we've just put into the chat a link to the bulletin, but as usual, we will also make sure to share the hymns on the screen when we get there. Folks here in Pilgrim Hall, because of the rain and the chilly weather, we are not outside, so we are not going to be singing our hymns. Um, but this is the invitation from Jim Munkris, our musician today. The invitation is for you to hum along to the hymns. Um, and that is how we will participate in the hymns. And on Zoom, you probably want to mute yourself, but you can just sing along. Um, that is one of the advantages of being on Zoom today. Uh, I want to tell you that it is a communion Sunday. So folks on Zoom, if you would like to bring your communion elements, we invite you to do that. And folks here, you have found them on your chairs. And today is a, an, a new adventure. We are entering into Sunday morning hybrid worship. We invite your patience as we figure out a couple of these pieces as we go along, as we move microphones, and as we make sure that everyone um, can fully participate. Zoom participants, um, in addition to now, anywhere until the pastoral prayer, I invite you to put your joys and concerns into the chat, and I will make sure that they are included in our prayers. And this is our summer worship series, which means we are very excited to be able to share with you that this next week, Claire is going to be our speaker, and then Susan Moffat will be our speaker, and then Susan Carabio will be our speaker after that. Um, so a really wonderful series of speakers, a fantastic series of Zoom hosts, and for July, our musician is Jim Munkris. Jim has picked our hymns for today, and we appreciate him doing that. We are an open and affirming congregation. Everyone is welcome. One of the things we have learned in this last 18 months is that when we say everyone is welcome, we mean everyone wherever you are. So with all of that in mind, um, I'm going to invite us to share in the call to worship, which is found in the bulletin. And uh, now, today, we have a one and an all uh, for the first time in a little while. So I invite you to join me in that. Thanks be to you, O oh God, that we have risen this day to the rising of life itself. Welcome to this gathering place, friend and stranger, saint and sinner in all who gather here. Come with hope or hesitation, come with joy or yearning, come all who hunger and thirst for life in all its fullness. Generous God, touch us through your spirit and bring us to the bright light of this new day. And now we will have our prelude by Jim, and I'm going to do a little uh, equipment change to get him set up. So enjoy this prelude. Thank you. 
Friends, let us continue with our unison prayer of confession in your bulletin. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to our brokenness, to the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive us, Christ renew us, and the Holy Spirit enable us to grow in love. God always redeems you. Take hold of this forgiveness and live your life in the spirit of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, before our hymn, the battle hymn of the Republic, I want to offer a word about that hymn. So many of you know that Julia Ward Howe, was an abolitionist who wrote the verses of the Battle Hymn of the Republic during, uh, while watching the civil, uh, the Union soldiers parade past her during the early days of the Civil War. The lyrics went on to inspire Union soldiers and later suffragists, labor organizers, and civil rights leaders, and even the current presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. I mention this because he featured the words of this hymn in his first sermon as presiding bishop. Many of us can hear a certain preacher very clearly in our minds. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's last public speech ended with lines from this song, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I also want to mention that there is a local connection to this hymn. There is a local UCC congregation that was the site of the first public performance of this hymn. That is the uh, Plymouth Church of Framingham, where I served for a brief period of time. And every time I would walk through the hallway, I would see the plaque that um, featured the program from the first time it was ever performed at that site and a letter from Julia Ward Howe many years later confirming that it was the first place it was ever performed. So, uh, by the way, Zoom folks, I'm going to show you a picture of that plaque in a minute. The folks here are going to have to wait until they look at it on the website later on. The glorification of war in the song causes me some dissonance, but as I am listening today, I want to focus, and I invite you to focus, on the themes of abolition and freedom. In the moment of its writing, ending slavery was a high moral purpose. And I wonder what our high moral purpose is today. I remember the words of this hymn say, as Christ died to make men holy, let us die to make men holy free. So now our first hymn today, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and it'll, I'm going to set it up for Jim and for our Zoom guests um, and members, and then Jim will take it away. And you people will be coming up singing. Jim will be singing to give um, a vocal line for our Zoom folks. Oh. 
Our scripture reading today comes directly from the lectionary uh, for today, and it is the Hebrew Bible reading. It is from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, and verses 9 to 10. And in this passage, we hear of the reuniting of the 12 tribes of ancient Israel, though it would not last. Listen for God's word to you. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from the Millo inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord. The God of hosts was with him. Here ends our reading. So King David is this really complicated figure in the biblical narrative. And human kingship is even more complex. To understand why, we have to go back to Samuel, the great judge, the one who, who anointed the first kings of the United Israel. At the end of his days, Samuel, this great judge, wanted his sons to carry on that role of judge over Judah. But the elders came to Samuel to ask for a king, which God had made clear was not necessarily a good idea. No matter how well they start, human rulers always seem to grasp for power or wealth. And human kings take people's loyalty away from God. Samuel, 1 Samuel 8 says, prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, God, from being king over them, just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. 
Now then listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Samuel warned the people that a king would take from them their money, their children, their livestock, but the people would not give up on the idea of a king. They said they had to have a king so that we may be like other nations and our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. They wanted a king because the other nations had a king. But ancient Israel had a particular relationship with God. And God recognized that special relationship could falter in the presence of a human king. So first came Saul, King Saul. He was okay, but not great. After his death, there was more fighting among the tribes, but eventually David, David, that little ruddy haired boy who was the shepherd, also anointed by Samuel, reunited the tribes. David is the king Israel would remember all the way through to today, King David, the writer of poetry, the shepherd king, the one who defeated Goliath, a charismatic leader. And he was also very fond of wealth and power, building himself a fancy capital at Jerusalem, complete with a kingly palace. Rob McCoy and Eric Fissler tune into that verse 10 as the turning point in this passage. David became increasingly powerful. For David, it wasn't a question of how long God would be with David. It was a question of how long David would be with God. What would happen when David stopped aligning with God's will and started seeing himself as great? What came with the palace that David built? Palace intrigue, David's adultery, murder, corruption. And then came the implosion of the kingdom. Yes, Israel's 12 tribes were united, but they started to fall apart after just one more king, King Solomon. It's not a stretch to say that when David stopped focusing on God's will and caring for the people and focused on his power and wealth, the country fell apart too. So ancient Israel is a theocracy. The tribes of Israel were defined by a shared faith. The biblical narrative suggests that there was an intense and direct connection between Israel and God. And God warned the ancient Israelites that a human kingdom would never be perfect. And that was what ancient Israel's next several generations proved. Why do I bring all of this up? When we look back with admiration on King David, shepherd king, uniter of the 12 tribes of Israel, it behooves us to also tell of his complexity. It's important that we tell the history of our ancestors in faith with open eyes, with honesty, with the realization of human failings. We sometimes paint history with rose-colored glasses, but human endeavors are not perfect. As Lisa Cressman puts it, whether you call it God's reign, fulfillment, or kingdom, it has not happened yet. Understanding the problems, as well as the glories of our past, allow us to move forward, forward toward the kingdom and the future that God would have us built. By the end, David was no longer loyal to God. God was with him, but he had stepped away from God and toward power. God's kingdom, from the earliest words that we have on human behavior, is a kingdom, a kingdom, a reign, a basileia that cares for the stranger, the orphan, the widow, 
and the poor. When the human kingdom was broken up and exiled, the biblical narrative tells us that the, a major reason for that was that people stopped caring for the stranger, the orphan, the widow, the poor. There seems to be a connection with human kingship in focusing on the trappings of human kingdoms. The kings and the people lost their loyalty to God's ways. And this is where we are in 2021. Now, we don't live in a theocracy, and we also don't live in a human kingdom. But so often, our primary loyalty seems to be with a nation. The stories we tell of human nations, the nations that we live in, and I'm aware that there are folks on this call and in this room who have more than one nation that you are part of, the stories we tell of human nations tend to be the good parts versions, looking away from moments in our history when we have mistreated the stranger or the orphan, the widow or the poor. We don't want to dwell in times of greed or militarism or racism or nationalism, but the whole truth is a gift because it keeps us aspiring toward justice and compassion and equality. For Christians, even as we very carefully keep church and state separate, I think our question is one of primary loyalty. Ultimately, what we aspire to and what we are first loyal to is God's kingdom, not David's ancient kingdom, nor Rome's empire, nor any human nation. If we're disciples first, then I believe we can look at the human nation in which we live with open eyes and continuously call it toward compassion and dignity, hospitality and equality for all people. As our next hymn says, God mend thine every flaw. Amen. And now we will have America the Beautiful Jim will play that for us, and I will turn it over to Jim.
I'd like to make sure that we have the chance to include any joys and concerns in our prayers today. So if you have a joy or a concern and you are here in the room, raise your hand and let us know. And if you have a joy or a concern and you are on the Zoom, I've seen at least one prayer concern come up. I invite um, you to include yours as well. Are there prayers that we would share today? Chris. Thank you for lifting up um, Elizabeth and Dick's leadership. Um, and I assume you mean that in regard to public health efforts and, and doing so much to keep us on uh, safe during this period of time. Thank you, yeah. Are there others that you would share today? Yes, yes. Folks at Surfside, after the terrible condo collapse now, a week on and still new and terrible news every day. From our Zoom, we are lifting up prayers for George and for Jean. Um, for George in hospice care now and um, praying for Deborah as she cares for him. For Jean after um, a heart attack, Nancy lifts her up for continued recovery from that. We pray also for Rabbi Shlomo Naginsky, who um, many of you know from the news was uh, harmed in, in what may have been an anti-Semitic attack in Brighton. And we pray with and for our Jewish siblings, um, remembering that anti-Semitic attacks are on the rise and that we cannot stand for. So we pray for an end to all violence that is based in prejudice and hate, and particularly for an end to anti-Semitic violence. David. Um, prayers for my wife, Ann, who uh, is dealing with the results of so many strokes that she's had in the past. Okay, for Ann, dealing with the results of so many strokes. Thank you. Let's gather in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, if we came to your house, we would find the door open because your hospitality has no bounds. If we came to your house, we would hear many accents and the voices of many cultures, ours just one among them, for there is no favored nation in the commonwealth of heaven. If we came to your house, we would see people we never thought would be allowed in if entrance had been by merit instead of by your grace. So as we gather here in your son's name, let us practice the hospitality and inclusion and love of your kingdom. We pray, O oh God, for all those who are in pain and suffering. We pray for those who are grieving. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are recovering. 
We pray for the people whose names we have lifted aloud, for George and Jean, for Anne, for the victims in Florida and their families, for victims of extreme weather around the world, and for Rabbi Shlomo and all of our Jewish siblings. We lift up our prayers. God, we are thankful to be together as a community, worshiping in hybrid form, as many people in person as on the Zoom, as many people on the Zoom as in person. We are glad for all the progress made in public health and particularly pray with thanksgiving and pray for strength for our leaders in those efforts. And among them, we name Elizabeth, our own. We lift up all these prayers, knowing, O oh God, that you hear the thoughts of our hearts. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Jim has prepared a musical offertory for us. In this new season of hybrid, we um, will remind our Zoom folks that you can give via our website and the folks who are here, there is an offering plate in the back um, that you may utilize for the offering or you may also give via our website. We are thankful for the gifts and the stewardship of this community. And now our offertory. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jim. Now, the folks who are gathered here, you have your communion elements. And the folks who are gathered on the Zoom, I hope you will pick up your communion elements and bring them to this gathering now. And we have bread, and we have the cup, and we will share this meal together. We are all welcome at this table. We are all welcome. That means everyone, because it is Christ who is the host of this table. And Christ has said that everyone is welcome. Welcome people of hope and faith. Welcome all who praise the living God. Welcome, welcome as we lift up our hearts to be fed and forgiven. On that night, that holy night, so many years ago, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. He lifted up this bread or something very like it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He gave thanks to God for this meal with his friends, even on that night. And he gave thanks to God for this cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant poured out for all of you for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would bless these simple, ordinary things, bread and juice, with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. So at this meal, Wherever we are, we will be blessed with your presence, your hope, and your love. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us now share in this holy meal together. And let us give thanks. The prayer is in our bulletin. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world united in courage and peace. And let us say the benediction together. May God, who knows your path and the places where you rest, be with you in your waiting, be your good news for sharing, and lead you in the way that is everlasting. Amen.
Friends, our worship service is complete. Um, and our fellowship time gets to start now. There's a little bit of lemonade, and there's a Zoom screen that has all of our friends and neighbors on it. So I'm going to turn the cart one more time so that you can come up and say hello to everyone who's on Zoom. I invite you to do that now. I'll stop the recording, and we'll just make sure that we all have time to have fellowship with one another throughout this community. Thanks for being here today. Well, there are people in the church as well. And it is summer. <laughs>